Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine. Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for, this is a very, very special episode for a couple reasons. One, it is the 400th episode of this TV show or internet show, whatever you wanna call it. Um, that's approximately, I don't know, I forgot to do the math uh, the other day or, or today, but it's it's a lot of years in, t in TV years. It's like 17, 20, 30, I don't know, 23 years if you have 26 episodes a season or something like that. Um, so a lot of a lot of years in TV years. Um, I'm almost at nine years uh, producing this program, even though I did have a one year hiatus. Um, so nine years ago, I started this thing in May of, of 2010. So um, I'm almost on that anniversary. Uh, but what reason I wanted this venue and, and to sit down with uh, basically two of my really good wine friends um, is that they have they were on, on my show before. And this is absolutely the first time I've done a, a second interview at a winery I've been to before. Um, and um, you guys have been super, super supportive of me uh, in what I do here and just everything I do outside of the podcast and my professional career. And uh, I also feel like I try to promote uh, Pedernalis as much as I can uh, because I truly believe in the products that they have here and the vision that they have for Texas wine. So I couldn't think of anybody else for interviewing wise, who I would want to interview more than, than these guys. Unfortunately, we didn't get all the gang back together. Uh, Farik uh, could not be here, uh, but I do have Julie and David. So um, without further ado, uh, do a little reintroduction of who you are in case they haven't watched it from five years sure, ago, yeah. and then we'll just hop in into it. Okay. Yeah, I'm Julie Colkin um, with Pedanala Cellars, and I do most of the sales and hospitality side uh, of our business here. Uh, it was our parents who planted the vineyard in 1995, Colkin Vineyards. And then we started Pedernal Cellars in 2000, 2006. And um, we're also going to talk about today our other winery, our Middles Leap Winery, uh, which was started in 2011. So, uh, but I will let Dave introduce himself. Yeah. So I'm, I'm the little brother, uh, <laughs> David. And like I said, here from the beginning as well, uh, like I said, all this stuff. Founded by Julie and Friedrich and, and Heather and I uh, back in 2006. I run the, the production uh, and the winery and vineyard side of this business. Uh, at this point, and sort of have the sort of overall role as sort of winemaker and president of the business. So we. Yeah, you have the cool little thing that says winemaker on I it. I do, I do. This makes it easy. <laughs> to know who I am. So, um, yeah, like I said, we're. Uh, we're <laughs> We're honored to get to be your first return uh, winery, so thank yeah. you for thinking of us for this. So yeah, to be 400th too. <laughs> yeah, and, and we've, over the, I would say at least two, three years, we've talked about, hey, you should come back up, do another interview, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll get it, I'll get around to it, get around to it, and then when I thought about doing the 400th episode, um, by the way, my father's over there, um, <laughs> he's got, so we got an audience member today. Um, but uh, I, I went to him. I said, what do you think, you know, what do you think about going to Pernalis for the 400th episode? Because when I did 300, I went to Max's Wine Dive and had a few people show up. And it was a lot of fun, but I, I just didn't want to do that again. I wanted to do something different, uh, maybe for episode 500 or the 10th anniversary, whichever one, you know, I do first. Maybe I'll go to High Street Wine Company with Scott and we'll do that because I go there all the time. But you know, I wanted to do an interview, and uh, I haven't been up to Texas wineries in this capacity in a long time. I know I visited here a few months ago, yeah. um, and uh, we had a great time, and um, we got to got went back to the winery. I hadn't been back there in well since the last time I was here, and uh, got to see a bottling truck, which I've mentioned yeah. a few times in other interviews. Sure. Um, so that was really cool. Um, so what has happened um, with the winery since 2012, since I was here last? Wow. Talk about the expansion. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I can definitely talk on the, the sort of the production side and everything. You know, that since 2012, we've grown uh, in terms of the production, but so has this industry. And I mean, I think that's a, 
a big part of it is, you know, like uh, 2012, it was still really in operation back there with me, and we had a couple of guys that were sort of the, the mainstays. But, you know, we've added on, since that time, we've added on a full tank room and facility with a new crush pad in the back. Um, we've taken on, you know, a good bit more production for ourselves as well as doing Armadillo's Leap. So we have right. all that going on. Um, and, you know, the thing is the, the industry expanded. So we're, you know, at that point, I think in 2012, you know, still probably the largest vineyard source for us would just have been our estate vineyard. And, of course, that's still very much part of us. But we've done very little. We've only added like a couple of acres in that vineyard. And yet we now work with a number of other growers that we hadn't been with before in the Hill Country and the High Plains. Right. Uh, and it's, you know, the thing is, is that the whole industry has grown in that respect. We've got so much more going on now with, uh, you know, with the existing growers having sort of kind of grown into more sort of sophisticated growers and a whole new host of growers coming on with varietals and blocks that, yeah, it's just, it's kind of changing the industry. Yeah. It's, uh, it's made for, it's made it possible for us to do a lot more and have a lot more options in terms of how we, you know, go about, you know, sort of building out the wines we want to do. So. Okay. And uh, when I was up here last, I mean, you, you made a different variety of wines, but I know the two that I focused on, well, there was three that we, I think that we actually had, but the two that we were focused on was Tempranillo and Viognier. Sure. Um, yeah. They were, seemed to be like flagship wines for you. And then uh, I do remember uh, a GSM yeah. mm-hmm. um, that we had. Um, since 2012, is Tempranillo still kind of the Texas red grape, or is that shifted elsewhere? Because I know that was big the big thing back then <laughs> and are we still thinking you know tempranillo is a, a good grape in general i mean remember texas is as big as france so it, yeah. it's it, we're talking like certain areas in texas where tempranillo does well not well, not everywhere actually i think that's the interesting thing about tempranillo tempranillo does grow well in a lot of the regions okay. and i think that's one of its strengths whereas i you know i don't think we're going to be in oregon where it's just pinot noir pinot noir right. pinot noir but I do think that Tempranillo is going to be a mainstay for a lot of wineries. Uh, but yeah, we see wineries that specialize in Italian varietals, and yeah. some that you know, specialize in other, you know, more nearly Bordeaux varietals, mm-hmm. uh, and then the Southern, the Rhone, very much. Right. So you, you see a good diversity, but we are still very much devoted to Tempranillo. Yeah. That okay. is the core of what we do. Yeah, those are our two. Those are the base of the red and white program. And yet, you know, if you're a wine club member with us, you're going to see a lot of other varietals and a lot of other blends, simply because. You know, the other thing that, that, that characterizes Texas a little bit, as she was saying, it's not just Pinot Noir or some single, you know, sort of varietal. You've got a whole host of varietals that, A, I think that's sort of indicative of the experimentation. Mm-hmm. The fact mm-hmm. that you don't have, you just don't have this sort of market driving standard of you've got to produce this one wine. And I think the other part of it is, is that honestly, given some of the variability of, you know, sort of microclimates, the, the, the sort of the larger climate that you have here in Texas, it really does benefit you to do some blending because you can you can kind of pick up these different elements you're going to get from these different varietals, and so you see a lot more going into right. those plants. So. And I mean the the acreage in Texas has just grown so much. Um, it, where's mostly expansion? Is it still in the high plains, or do you have other areas? Oh, absolutely, the high yeah, plains. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's uh, there's actually a lot of new vineyards here in the Hill Country, so that's encouraging to see. But it's always, you know, anywhere from one to 30 or 40 acres, you're mm-hmm. seeing these sort of relatively smaller uh, plantings just because of the, the availability of water, the types of soils you're getting here. Whereas, you know, in the High Plains, you know, the, a new vineyard is, is considered small when it's in the 100 or 200 range at this okay. point, and you're seeing some much larger ones and much larger plantings going in, which from a sort of a seeing more Texas wine ultimately out there in retail and out there at restaurants is a good thing. I right. think you'll, you'll see more of it because there's there's now going to be a sort of a scale to enable that, I think, so. Yeah, some of the bigger wineries who can really shift to, you know, to using all 100% Texas grapes and, yeah. and all right. that, and that will just get more Texas wine in front of people, and in a wider variety of price points. Right. So, I mean, I think the other thing about the, the growth of, of vineyard is, you know, between 2012 and today, in 2018, of course, there was the 2013 freeze event that just wiped out the harvest of uh, grapes that year. Right. And uh, it led to a kind of do or die moment of, okay, we either give this up or we're going to just double down and everybody doubled they down. They doubled down, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're proud of them for doing, especially those high plains growers because yeah, I, they, they had took a real hit. They, they took a real hit and a lot of them have been, you know, sort of, they've been risking a lot more than they, they normally would on this because I think they believe that this is really the future for right. them as far as their, their, their agricultural businesses. So. 
What what makes the High Plains such a, a really good place for, I mean, for even people who live in Texas and people who don't know anything about Texas, to them it's probably desert. And so why would, <laughs> why would something so arid um, or so flat uh, be a good place? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I mean, I think, I think as far as... I mean, the, the stop signs are like four feet tall because the wind's so yeah. high, you know? Well, I mean, the irony is sometimes I think the ideal wine region is one where it's perfect for the agricultural part. And, of course, the other part is, is that it's an attractive tourist destination. Okay. It's got one of the two, right? Yeah. <laughs> it is actually an ideal growing condition uh, location. And then you've got the good diurnal shift, right? You really have the cool evenings. You do have nice, dry, arid days with lots of sunlight. Um, and that elevation is a benefit to you in terms of just the, the, the sort of the, all those climate settings. It's still, it, being an inland region, you don't have the moderating effects, say, of an ocean. So you're right. going to get some of these these crazy swings. You get hailstorms. You're going to see... Uh, Wait, spring you're gonna, yeah, you're going to see these freezes. And that is the big hazard that, of course, hit them in 13. Mm -hmm. And it's what a lot of their investment has been around controlling or at least mitigating, right? So right. You, now big difference between 2012 and today is you don't really see a vineyard out there that doesn't have frost protection. They all have put in all kinds of fans and towers in order to control that. Um, and you even see some putting in hail protection because, again, at the, the scale they're at and everything else, it's worth the investment of those kinds of systems. So, and, and that, when you, when you start to put those things in place, it's making it a better and better growing region because mm -hmm. the climate is it's good and the water mm -hmm. availability is reasonable. Um, it's particularly better suited for grapes where I mean, those given the crops they were planting, this right. is something that uses a lot less water. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's why we see a lot of the growth shifting over to it. But it's also why you just see a lot more investment in infrastructure to do it really as a high quality production, not just as sort of some other kind of row crop, if you will. That they're right. Yeah. Out there. So, you know. Yeah, because uh, they were mo more cotton than anything else out there. And cotton, cotton uses a ton of water. It does. Cotton yeah. Peanuts. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, I mean. Just, you know, in what I've seen with Texas wines and, and, and the, the acreage, uh, it's just great because um, one of the things I, I loved about uh, you guys is using 100% Texas grapes. Um, and, and, and I'm not trying to knock anyone who doesn't because there is, I got to keep the lights on also. But um, uh, but at the same time, you know, I think you, you already alluded to it that, you know, with, with more and more acreage, they're is less and less reason for people to, unless they just have huge production and they just, they need to meet the yeah. demand mm -hmm. to bring grapes from California or I guess New Mexico, I guess occasionally they bring yeah, them in. Occasionally. Yeah. 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 But most California is just California. The size they just have grapes. the most to give. Yeah, I was gonna say. So. <laughs> and realize the entire country gets their grapes from California. It's not just a Texas thing. Yeah. Um, there's this uh, for sale in Texas only thing. And I think some of the Texas residents feel like it's like some texas law and it's like no it's federal law and every state has it so um i've seen it in other states on the back of their wine labels but i think sometimes the the people that are advocate advocating for texas only wine which i i love um i think sometimes they lose focus that it's not just a texas thing it's mm -hmm. nationwide but we are getting to the point of being i think uh an area where it's less and less reason to import unless like you don't have any grapes yet you've got to start your winery some you know for whatever reason something like that um let's talk about armadillo's leap um and as i shared with you before we started i literally don't know anything about it i feel embarrassed <laughs> because I, I i've known these guys for for a while and i know about armadillo's leap i follow armadillo's leap on you know the social media and i know something about it but i don't know anything like what was the impetus why do you have it you know it, how is it in relation to pedernalis and and all that yeah, Armas Leap was really, I mean, as, as we said, you know, Tempranillo and Viognier is the focus of our program. Yeah. And sort of everything's oriented around that. And so you get kind of locked into that because that's just, that's what you do uh, as a brand is you, you know, you, you focus and you stay focused. And so Armas Leap was, you know, was and is a chance to experiment and just do different things that we would not put, it, put under a pet analysis label. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's had sort of an odd trajectory in terms of its hospitality because we opened a tasting room in Rocky Hill, which is the location along 290, and within six months, I was saying, you know, we really should be in town, because that makes a <laughs> lot more sense. And it was almost by magic. There, a space opened up that had been uh, occupied by the same uh, shop for 37 years, yeah. uh, right in the middle of Fredericksburg. And so we jumped on it, and it's taken about, what? You it, leaped on it. You left yeah, on we it. left on it. That's exactly <laughs> it. So anyway, it's taken about, it's been about sort of an 18-month saga to completely close the Rocky Hill and, you know, mm -hmm. renovate. And we just finished sort of a, a, a 
sort of remodel to right. really bring it to where we wanted to on Main Street. And so we have decided ultimately to keep it as a it's it's a dual location, so it's a co-branded location, but it, they the wines complement each other, yeah. and it's it's a really nice experience down there. I sort of wanted us to be able to yeah. drive down there and be there, but it was just you know, yeah. enough hours in the day. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. but uh, it's a really nice space. You stop in and do the tasting. Yeah. And well, on the wine side, we, we got all day long. We yeah. do whatever we want. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was one of the one of the ideas was um, is go into town, uh, and you know. Town is what 15, 20 minutes away. 20 yeah, minutes. yeah, twenty. Yeah, so it's not. It's not like you know you're right down the road. It's kind of like where where we live in San Antonio to go anywhere that we want to go. It takes like twenty minutes to get there anyway. Mm -hmm. And we're not in the country like this. <laughs> it used to be kind of the country, but not not anymore. Yeah. But um, but yeah, uh, you know, I th I just you know I think uh, we'll we'll definitely check it out. So, are is this more of a uh, 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 value uh, wine? Is this um, I mean far as pricing structure and and all that or is it similar to Pedernales or yeah I'll say it fits in the mid to lower part i guess okay. yeah it overlaps because we haven't done some of the high-end type of like wine club reserves for yeah. okay no, there's, there's nothing at this point like a family yeah. reserve right yeah but we're not at the same time we're not pricing it really like in a whole segment below like our our part um and it's it is meant to complement as much because as mm -hmm. you're saying i mean it it's given us a chance to do like a varietal moved, to do like an Italian blend, which is mm -hmm. something that's not typical for us, to do a sparkling, a number of right. things that, again, it's not that we can't do them under Pedernales, but it is in terms of trying to be brand focused. We're it's a nice place to be able to set aside and then develop a kind of following that's kind of interested in these other other pieces of what we do. And it, again, it works nicely for a tasting room down there because yeah. now we can sort of complement in these different things and give a a different experience where someone can come and get some Pedernales wine, but then also experience some of the ale lineup and put, try stuff that we make that just doesn't necessarily sort of, you know, Fit isn't in. just the same kind of thing we're always turning it out here. So yeah. It's also important to note that Armadillo's Leap was a name we considered at the outset. Yeah. Oh, really? We okay. We were originally naming it. It was one of the ones that was sort of thrown out there. And we just decided it wasn't appropriate for what we were trying to do, you know, in this in the initial launch into wine. Yeah. Uh, it's also important to know we actually do have another label, which is an allocation label, allocation model label, which is the Kolkin Osterberg line. Yeah. Which I think I've seen mentioned here yeah. and there, yeah. you know. Yeah. So we have, that's another thing that's changed since 2012, is in 2012 we had just gone into distribution with mm -hmm. Pedernales, and yeah. so we were... Our work at that point, from a branding point of view, was to say, okay, these are going to be our distribution wines, these are going to be our tasting room wines, and that was where we are. And we now have that more or less, you know, chugging along, you know, from right. year to year. And so in, since then, we've also experimented with the Armadillo Sleep, uh, to look at some other, you know, more experimental wines, and then the Colcan Osterberg to really say, uh, it's very much focused on Portuguese varietals, which are heavily okay. planted in Colcan vineyards. And there's just sort of no good home yeah. for them to, to really shine because they do shine uh in the hill country so yeah, and on that ageable in terms of like the sort of on the long end on the back end of the okay so yeah and on those varietals you're you're more towards uh non-fortified versions of oh. that oh yeah okay yeah. Mm -hmm. I know you want to go through the varietals. So you know. Yeah, so the, t the typical ones that are in that wine will use a, a Tariga Nacional mm -hmm. and then a Tintacao and a Tinta Amarela. Okay. Um, we, and then we'll use Tempranillo typically. Um, and we've, we've played around with some other sort of, you know, some finishing varietals, including like Malbec and Moved in there at times. But basically the, the base of that has been consistently those, the Portuguese varietals. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. anyway. And no, uh, no Alvarino type uh, you know, trying to do a vino verde oh, type of thing. Yeah. No, that would be an armless leap wine. Okay. Yeah, yeah it would right. be really. That's actually one of the ones we sort of thrown out. It's like, you know, this is a chance to do that. We haven't done it yet, but I think that's definitely yeah. an armless leap type. Okay. Yeah. Type wine, just a you know, very approachable, uh, fresh. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's the thing is, is that, uh, you know, Armadillo's Leap gives us, given that it's the, the other other thing we, we wrestle with sometimes is just scale, right? Like in order to make a wine that can be available to the, the customers in the tasting room and the wine club, we're having to, there's, there's, a, there's a sort of a minimum size and some of these sort of more interesting experimental things, it's either, you know, a single block from a, some varietal or, you know, some, some vineyard or it's just something we want to do on a smaller scale. And that's the other nice thing with AL is, is that, Armadillo's Leap, we can we can do those. We can have them in the tasting room and make them available to those customers. And you know, it's kind of a it's a, it's a fun little sort of test bed sometimes. Right. So. Yeah. It was otherwise some some of those blocks just disappear, you know, yeah. into a larger blend, and they don't get to to show what they really could do. Right. So. Um, so, uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. So distribution for for you guys, 
Um, has, has it expanded? You know, are you in a lot of states? You know, how is that? <laughs> how yeah, does that work out? Mostly in Texas. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we distribute only in Texas. We do have about ten states that we do direct ship to. So okay. For wine club members and for online orders and that sort of thing. And we're so. looking to expand that. Yeah. That, that we'd like yeah. to the direct consumer uh, shipping. I think that's that's on the the, the, the horizon. Mm-hmm. Getting out of Texas, it's always like you know, there's three of the ten largest cities in the United States right. here. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so it's just that's a lot of consumers and you know. It's so much easier to deal with one distributor than to have to deal with distributors in all these different Different states. states, And that it's an enormous barrier. You gotta really have something you wanna achieve to bother with that, basically. Yeah. 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 And the industry put together like a little media tour uh, this last fall in New York with about thirteen of the wineries. And it was interesting. Um, it was interesting because of course none of us distribute in New York, (laughs) right? So there was a lot of why are you it's cool to check you out. (laughs) Can I get this wine? And of course no, not right now. Yeah. Um, and I think it was a, like a, it, it it acted as sort of an opportunity for both sides to kind of feel it out, mm-hmm. and there is interest on both sides. But as she said, that, that it, the business case is the one that we have to make, which mm-hmm. is that you know this is this is a big state. You know, I don't think I don't you know, no citation needed on that. <laughs> yeah, um, you've driven a lot of it. Yeah. yeah, and and it has these growing markets that honestly are huge opportunities for the the industry as it is scaled now. So. To go out of state, it is more this kind of long play of are you looking for a maybe that, you know, recognition right of being in those markets, and then of course looking out much further, yeah, is that a space you want to start trying to sort of lay the ground for? But it it hasn't it just hasn't gotten to that point yet. I suspect you'll see it sooner or later, and you do see a few of the wineries that have sort of managed to get wine out of state with like sort of one off deals, but okay. no one has consistent distribution doing that. Right. Yet, so mm-hmm. anyway. Um, and they're going to talk about that, that group went to New York. So that is that part of the Texas fine wine? Some of those are part of the Texas, because I know you're involved in that. Yes. Yes. yes okay. That, was, that sure. actually formed since I should, yeah. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. Yeah, that, exactly. That started, it sort of had a sort of prequel, uh, in 2013. We, we've had a hospitality suite at Texom, which is held in, uh, in Dallas every summer. Uh, at the Four Seasons, and we brought together a set of wineries. We, we had the, you know, Pernal's had a hospitality suite, but we realized it was more effective if we had more than one Texas winery in there, and so we invited several others, and then we started talking about it, like, yeah, that worked really well, you know, to be side by side. You know the people you're pouring with, you could stand for their, you know, you'll stand up for their wines, and they'll stand up for yours. And so we then formed the Texas Fine Wine Group in 2014, and we have, it's a marketing initiative. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, you know, it's not like the Texas Hill Country Winery Association which does lots of things it's just all about marketing and it's it expanded a few years later and so now it is it is ourselves brennan vineyards dukeman family winery bending branch winery and spicewood winery and i'm always the well, us. Oh, okay, I guess I missed us before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the, the, and us. <laughs> I say it's news to me. If it's <laughs> so, uh, and yeah, we do we do events. The the this was the New York trip was not organized by Texas Fine Wine, uh, but we did sort of piggyback Absolutely. on it to yeah. do some desk visits and things yeah. uh, in New York because we've gotten some good press. I mean, that's also we've been now in the Wine Enthusiast magazine I think four times, which okay. I think yeah. in 2012 we hadn't yet been. And so we're seeing interest. Yeah. It's just what you get from the big national publications. It's like, well, can my buyer in California get you? And the answer is no. <laughs> right, yeah. Unless you have it shipped direct, so you don't. Yeah. yeah, but it is a great vehicle for us to sort of demonstrate that there are, there's not, it's not just a one-off phenomena that there's high-quality wine in Texas, that right. you really have a number of producers producing, you know, some similar but also some different styles. And, the, you know, that is it's pretty much the character of the industry and where it's going. So it's good. It's yeah. been a great group to be part of. Honestly. Oh, yeah. No, it, it turned out. That was actually, that was Frederick's initiative. He had gotten the hospitality suite and really sort of thinking through, you know, what can we do with this kind of, you know, group marketing? Because you, yeah. you, we really, you know, for, that, was, that was true in 2012, is you're not just selling your wine. You're always selling Texas wine at the same time. Yeah. And this was a way of selling Texas wine as fine wine, of saying, no, we're not just, we don't just think it's fun to make wine in Texas. We're serious about this, and right. we're doing it on the model of, you know, all fine wine regions. It's yeah. not that winery that makes the peach wine with no, the donkey on the, yeah, on the side. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's, that that's a different thing. model. That's a different model. I s- <laughs> and you know what? That might be beautiful wine for a peach wine. I, it's just not my, oh, yeah. my my liking. But the yeah. first time I saw that in the name of the winery, I won't mention. Um, <laughs> not, not, not to not give any advertising. Just, you know, I just try to keep a clean... <laughs> 
clean thing, but you know, the other word for donkey and fat and, and is, is it peach wine? I'm like, I don't think I'm going to check that out. <clears throat> I think I'll go elsewhere. But um, as far as the Texas Fine Wine Group, I think I've visited everybody except for Brennan at some point. Yeah, because um, they're actually, in Comanche. Yeah, yeah they're probably the farthest out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've actually done interview. I did an interview at Dukeman. Um, I think it was around the same time I did the same interviews with all you guys. Oh, right. yeah. I think it was around the same time. Um, and I've been to Dripping Springs um, uh, before. And I've not, I've not been to Bending Branch, which... I know Jennifer, <clears throat> Jennifer, uh, it's like, but it's like an hour and a half drive anyway. It's like driving here. Um, but you know, they, they also make some really, uh, fun wines and, yeah. and, uh, so it's just, they're, they're kind of in my backyard, but so is this effectively. Yeah. So, yeah. but no, um, I can tell you that those wines, all, all those wineries make really good wines, um, that, you know, can stand up to just about anything out there. So, um, I think it was really great that, that, that group was put together mm -hmm. yeah no, it's, it's sure. been yeah it's been successful in, i would say in, in my mind beyond our expectations yeah, yeah. It's, it's turned into a, a key part and it's it's a differentiator it's a differentiator from other you know other models business models yeah. uh, because we're gonna you know our intention is not to at this point to ever be a hundred thousand cases right and all of these winders are in, in sort of our fifteen thousand case okay. range i think duke was slightly larger and bending branch is slightly smaller kind of thing but we're all right in that same, you know, large boutique size. Wondering. Yeah. So. Yeah, you don't have to be a million cases, you know. <laughs> I mean, you want, if you want to, that's fine. <laughs> if you want to, that's fine, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, let's let's kind of do a little tasting of some sure, wine. Sure. Yeah. Um, it is slightly cooler this year than it was five years ago in December. Um, they're dressable appropriately. I didn't <laughs> dress that way. Actually, I do. I have my hoodie, but I, I, I can't show off the 1337 wine shirt if I turn put the hoodie on so i joked with my father that i was gonna wear the same shirt as i wore last time because i still have it's like kind of a whitish polo shirt but um it's wrinkled <laughs> so didn't make it out no it didn't make it out so, so i did check it was clean it just was wrinkled so uh what do we have yes, in the glass this today first one is a throwback to uh, honestly 2012 when yes we, we would have this wine this is a blend that we did literally is i think the first white blend we were ever doing and it's a viognier blend that we'll then typically do a couple different varietals into okay um and so i think with this addition uh, the two most prominent is the viognier and then there's albarino in there um but we also work with vermentino and we'll even work with a little muscat sometimes in these mm -hmm. blends. so um but it's definitely like a most years we've done this, honestly. Yeah, there was yeah. A, there was a hiatus. I, well, we didn't do it in 2013, obviously, right, yeah. because there were very few white grapes in 2013. And then I don't think we did it in 2014, but I think we we introduced it in 2015. It's either yeah. the 15 or 16. This is the 16. In the okay. 16, yeah. And this one has a good bit of Vermentino in this one. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which makes it a little different, but. Yeah, and Vermentino is a varietal that's come on to our program. I think since you were here, because I, I think the first guys I saw using that were were Dukeman. Um, yeah. And like it was one of the bigger plantings at one of our, our grower, the Bingham Vineyard. And so at some point we started using it and actually I love the varietal. It's, um, it just brings in these sort of crisp citrus notes and the kind of thing that we don't always get with the way that we harvest DNA. We typically harvest those a little later to pick up those sort of richer aromatics. And so again, it's a great, we will do a varietal Vermentino many years, but it's also a great blender. Yeah. Reason, so, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, Dukeman, they don't necessarily specialize, but they do work with a lot of Italian varietals, mm -hmm. and they do yeah. a really good job of that. And that Vermentino, especially, is is really good. Um, this is this is awesome. Yeah. This is if it was like maybe 15, 20 degrees warmer, it would be perfect for out here. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, this is very refreshing, and just the the variety of, of yeah. white grapes in it are are really uh, you know a nice blending of the flavors and aromas. I, I did take my allergy medicine today, but um, my voice is still a little bit from the weekend. I guess the mountain cedar blew in over the weekend, and I was under under the weather, kind of. I mean, I had to get a steroid shot just to, yeah. just to function. Oh, God. Yeah, so, but my voice is still not quite 100%, but... Here, I'll do an, an off uh, here. Wanna... Oh, okay, I, I just finished mine, but... Yeah. Right, I can oh. do it. You want to, like, pour out so we can do the other? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Or uh, he's driving. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I drove up here, but that's why he's that's why he's here in case I indulge a little bit. So this is the Texas Hill Country Tempranillo. Okay. You can say something about it. Yeah, and this one blends from our estate and as well from uh, uh, one of the vineyards that we have up in the uh, 
the Mason area. Okay. Uh, Parr Vineyards. And, and Rob Parr has been another grower that's been with us near here from the beginning. Like he was planting in the same time frame. We were making our expansions out of the estate. And so by 2009, 2010, he started to become a part of the program. So um, again, the, the Tempranillos here, you pick up a lot of what, you know, is sort of typical of the hill country Tempranillo, a little bit more of the earthiness that yeah. Tempranillo can bring out. Um, but it still has some of those fruit notes that you associate with the varietals and the cherry and the, those sorts of things. Oh, yeah. So um, we'll do, usually do this about 12 to 15 months, uh, predominantly American oak, and a little mix of new and then some of the either used or sort of second use varieties. So, okay. Yeah. yeah, no, it's very, I mean, we, when we can, we produce both a Texas Hill Country and Texas High Plains Tempranillo, and they're very interesting side-by-sides. There's a tendency, because they're largely going to our wine club, that we don't actually have them both at the same time, because one will go at one point and one will go at the other point, so you have to save your bottles so you can do your side-by-side. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, there's different, they are very different. In the high plains, you're going to get more more of the fruit character because yeah. of that diurnal shift. The fruit character comes out more uh, forcefully. Yeah. So. <clears throat> and I, I find, just in kind of general with um, Texas wines and also Spanish wines, there there is this similar like you feel like you're out here in the field with these trees and the brush, and I feel like I get those flavors in in wines like yeah. this and. Um, it did tend to be from Spanish varietals, and so since we have a few Spanish varietals in Texas, um, I tend to associate them very similar. Like if I'm doing a blind tasting and I'm trying to decide if it's a Rioja or not, if it tastes like a Texas wine, a good Texas wine, um, then I'm probably going to lean towards lean towards the Rioja side. I don't know if it's just the varietal or it's just there's enough similarity in, in our terroir yeah. with, with, with Spain, but or it's just or I just... In my head, I've made that connection, and it just it's it's not really there. You know? I would say one of the things about Tempranillo is it is extremely terroir driven in the sense, or terroir expressive. Yeah. In yeah. that you can taste it in different parts of our own vineyard, it's it tastes dramatically different. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and certainly between the high plains, and I think one of the things we're going to see going forward, I mean, we are our, this has already in effect happened to us because we you know, our vineyard is located in Bell Mountain AVA, so we're actually with in a sub AVA within the Texas Hill Country AVA. But I think you're going to see more of that subdivision to pick up that, no, my Tempranillo is never going to taste like their Tempranillo because it doesn't. Right. Sure. So, and you start trying to say, hey, there's a, you know, a sub-region here we want to highlight. And I think that's the next step. I think you'll see it in the High Plains as well because they're already talking about it. Yeah. So you'll, you'll look for more sub-regions in the High Plains and the Hill yeah, Country? The hill country. No, I I definitely, that, yeah. And I definitely think it's, I mean, it is fun to be able to highlight with consumers the these differences because they really do show up. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, the, the soil differences in, in the Hill Country are can be dramatic in terms yeah. of what you're sitting on. That's like what you're saying. Like even in our vineyard, we've got a site, you know, one portion where the Tempranillo is sitting in a really sort of, you know, deep sandy soil. And then you go up the hill and then all of a sudden it's a sort of granitic mix with like a sandstone layer. And it's, you know, that's a few hundred feet apart. Right. And that, that definitely influences what comes out of those blocks. Um, and then, of course, you know, High Plains. Though it's a little more consistent across the High Plains, that it's different between here and there is substantial. So, mm -hmm. And again, we, uh, we're for Wine Club and for those, we'll do a lot of these, like sort of single varietal, single lot, just because it's a chance for sort of our Wine Club members have been with us a while to start to learn more about those vineyards right. and what they produce. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now we're coming out. Uh, with a particular signature series where we're literally, it's only a barrel of two. Yeah. Um, hmm. uh, but those wines, you know, don't expect them on the shelf anytime soon. <laughs> Wine club members are going to right. <laughs> mostly see those. But it is an opportunity to, and it, it is also consumer education because as they taste those differences, they're going to want those differences right. to be signaled more obviously sure. in the, the labeling that we're able yeah. to do. So. I, um, when in, in the trip to Burgundy, uh, that was really um, see, uh, the talking about differences in soil um, is very pronounced because it's hilly, and you are seeing you know how how erosion, how the valleys and how the hills are created, and how all that is. Whereas you know in Bordeaux, it's flat. You know, not, I mean, yeah, it's it's more alluvial, so yeah, you have that, but it wasn't as dramatic. Yeah. And then even when going out to Napa, yeah, we hit some of the um, we hit some of the mountain AVAs, um, but we were in the valley more, more than anything else. So talking about soil with them was, was not the same, sure. you know, so, uh, 
It's, um, it's a big thing in Texas. Yeah. If you look at a geological map of particularly the hill country, it's like a peacock's tail. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so many different things, and, and you get all kinds of, like, one of the, uh, one, to me, one of the most interesting ones is the fact that Spicewood does a just very, very good Sauvignon Blanc. We tried to grow Sauvignon Blanc, and it was a disaster because it didn't work on our site, but it works in their site because they have limestone, mm -hmm. and the Sauvignon Blanc just eats that up and you know, becomes expressive and everything you want. So it does make a difference where you are. Absolutely. Yeah. And but last but not least. Yeah, your family reserve. And yeah. this is this is a this would be the, the first wine we started blending. I think so. We started with a 2006 edition of this. Mm -hmm. So it's you know over the years it's usually started as an estate driven wine, um, but then we'll use some of the, the sort of choice blocks from outside growers to complement this wine. Okay. Um, and so to that extent, the varietal mix varies each year. I would actually myself have to go back and look on the 2014 to see precisely what's in it. Yeah, um, 14 I don't know. But again, it typically is led by the Tempranillo from our vineyard as a okay. starting point, and then it's we'll work Syrah. with some, yeah, we'll typically work with a little bit of Syrah and Cab. Um, Cab, notably, it's not a variety we work with a lot, but it is one that um, we've still got small amounts in the estate vineyard, and we will get some from the Newsom Vineyard up in the High Plains, which okay. is the one place that we really work with Bordeaux varietals, simply because they're at that nearly 4,000 foot mark. They have really good diurnal shift, and it's... They focus on those varietals, so most of those cabs are what, 25 year old mm -hmm. okay. vines, and so it, it is a nice nice component to be able to bring into a blend like this. But okay. uh, but again, this is meant to be more of the sort of longer aging of the so the primary lineup, and so it's typically in the barrels French and American for at least 18 years. So. Okay, um, the cab up up in the uh, high plains uh, for our soil type is it more of a uh, easy draining soil like you don't have a lot of clay up there or yeah, you don't see. There, there may be a few clay sites, but typically there's just like a sandy loam right. sitting over like a caliche base. So you'll get uh, anywhere from as little as, say, like a foot of that sandy loam up to upwards of three feet. But then, um, you know, those soils, they actually don't drain as fast as you would think, but it's partly just a lot of it is very creative uh, sort of soil management by a lot of those guys as well in order to sort of retain some more moisture in that. Okay. Um, and then they'll do... They will irrigate these, and so they'll typically do some below ground drip periodically as needed. But it varies year to year. They can have essentially no irrigation years, and then they can have years where, frankly, if one of these fronts moves in and they've, they're dealing with flooding issues, so yeah. it, can, it can really be all over the map. You know, that's an interesting difference up there as opposed to down here. I mean, down here, all the irrigation is drip irrigation. Right. But up there, they bury it because uh, I was talking to Neil Newsom, he says basically the, the coyotes. Oh, wow, it okay. Out if they had it above ground. So huh. yeah. I mean, the other thing that you know, to picture is, is that the high plains, and even in the during the grazing season can be like this, but definitely during the winter, I mean, it's a harsh place. Yeah. Like when these when these fronts move in, they'll get 60, 70 mile an hour winds and a sand blast. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, luckily for the vines, they, they can handle that, or especially when they're dormant, but even if they're not, they can. Mm -hmm. um, but there's just a lot of stuff that it's much more efficient and it's just a lot more practical for that stuff yeah. to be below ground. You guys thought I was joking about the four foot tall, four foot tall stop signs. I mean, <laughs> the wind is really bad out it there. Really I mean, strong. all of West it Texas, is, is you know, from Amarillo down to Lubbock and all that. I mean, they're not four feet; they're like five feet. They're not. They're not like you know the seven or eight feet yeah. tall signs. They are short because it's so windy. Yeah. Now the wind gets <laughs> blows the. I mean, literally blows the dirt from one farmer to another and then back again. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's pretty intense. Yeah. Well, it. Um, Someday I'm going out there. I actually kind of looked at maybe a few months from now, uh, taking enough time off from work so I can take the one day, the whole day drive out there, yeah. spend like three or four days. Uh, my goal with that is actually not just to visit the, the, the few wineries that I know of out there that I know make pretty good wine, but actually to visit the vineyards no, and talk with them. Neil would be very glad to yeah, show you around. And, and talk with them. And I, if I could make a plug too, I mean, one option to go out there is Neil has what's called Newsom Grape Days, and it's okay. essentially like a two-day event. Now it's sort of becoming almost a three-day event, but it'll bring together all the growers and a lot of the wineries out there at his place. And so it's a chance. They do vineyard tours and everything as part of it. Mm -hmm. And it's a chance to see them and really see the growers kind of like you know give you like a hands-on yeah. about everything they're doing. So anyway. Something to check out, but that's in April. So. I guess it'd be impromptu, impromptu mog, mm -hmm. MOG, material <laughs> other than grapes. Yeah. See, I know a couple things. Yeah. It was just, it was like, whoa, oh, that's a terroir. <laughs> Oak terroir. 
something blown in. But no, this is, I like this wine a lot. It's, it's hard yeah. not to like the Family Reserve. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> if you, if you exactly. walk in and you don't like the Family Reserve, it's like probably. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, that peach wine place down the road would be perfect for you. <laughs> I don't like to disparage other wineries because it is their business. I mean, Miller Lite's my favorite, you know, not premium yeah. beer out there, you know, but. Oh, what I'll say on their behalf is they do what they do Extremely quite well. well. And they you know, know and what that's, they're doing and they do it pretty well. And that's that's all that matters, you know. I mean, not everything is going to be to everybody's taste. No, they you know, know who their customers are and they're making something that is great for them. You know, uh, one of my first interviews was one of the icons of Texas of Texas wine making um, uh, with the Allers. Mm-hmm. Um, he has a wine called Ed Smooth Red, and he loves it, and people love it, and it's just not my cup of tea. Yeah. Um, is it a well-made wine? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it, it's well-made. It's easy drinking. It's meant to for you, you. You just mow the lawn. You want something refreshing and easy to drink. It's got a little sweetness to it, and Texans love sweet red wines. Um, and uh, you know, he 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 rolled it out with a bunch of other wines that day, and I had. I think I had already had it in the past, and I was like, "Just so you know, I don't really like this wine, but you know, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, it's okay. I I don't want to, I don't want to insult your wine, but um, and, and they they've been they were I actually got to see them. It was at the same time we came up here, right? We went over there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah. after here, we went yeah. over there, yeah. and I got to see the Allers. Uh, they just happened to be down there, down over at the uh, the Dripping Springs. What was it? Trip? Yeah. Whatever town. They're down in. Um... Driftwood. Yeah, Driftwood. Driftwood. That's it. Driftwood. Yeah, Driftwood. Um, it was one of the D names in Texas. I don't know. Uh, they're they're near each other, kind of. But yeah, Driftwood um, set up up in Tau, which is where I mm-hmm. where I met them. Um, so they had their extra place down there. But um, yeah, I mean, there's 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 a market for everything. Right. There's a market for everything. Um, uh, I don't mention where I work, but where I do work, uh, s- somewhat in the past, uh, somebody ordered a white Zinfandel. And uh, it was a table of three people. There was two guys and a, and a lady. And the lady ordered a white Zinfandel. And it was by the, by the glass. And I came over and poured it. And she said that her companions were making fun of her because she was drinking fruit punch. And I looked and said, well, there's a market for it, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll serve it. You know, you want it. I don't currently carry any white Zinfandel. <laughs> but, <clears throat> I mean, the point is, if that someone likes white Zinfandel, more power to you. Yeah, you know, like drink it. <laughs> yeah, drink it if you want it. Uh, it you know. Too. Yeah, that's the same. <laughs> so that, was, that was going pretty strong in the 80s. <laughs> Especially, you know, not bad for a mistake wine. So. Yeah, well, it's, it's an interesting For stuck that. fermentation, so. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, um, I, I know that uh, you all definitely, I know you have something you got to get done. <laughs> Uh, basically, we when I scheduled this, he apparently had something scheduled at the same time. So I do appreciate no, you hanging uh, out with me. Um, and people. even I'm getting a little bit chilly. I still have extra insulation, <laughs> but it's I'm still getting a little chilly out here. And um, uh, I definitely appreciate you guys spending the time with me again. Awesome. And I mean, oh, this is not the this is not the first time I've been to the winery since 2012. <laughs> Uh, but they've always been gracious. Uh, spent time with me when I come into the tasting room, or the last time I came up, we went to the went to the actual winery and hung out for a little bit. And of course, at Texom, I got to see them every year at Texom. So um, uh, you know, the the relationship over the years has been wonderful, and uh, I look for uh, look forward to more and more years of a wonderful yeah, uh, relationship. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and uh, cheers to 400 uh, folks. That's going to do it. Uh, click the links above to friend me up. Click the links below to uh, check out more about uh, Petronalis and Armadillo's Leap. Um, I'm going to plug the, the donation button over here for a second. Uh, I usually don't do it during interviews, but um, you hit the donate button. Somebody donate. Anyway, anyway, uh, and uh, we will see everyone again next time. <laughs>